Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh with Adam and third person is on the line. He's our special guest. His name is Igor Popov. He is the chief economist at Apartment List, a former economist at Airbnb, which many of our listeners have used, probably stayed at an Airbnb. But he's a chief economist now at Apartment List. And he's here today to talk about what he calls the quarantine economy, the work from home movement, the future of remote work, and a paper he put out or that apartment list put out, he headed the research. It's called The Economy's Growing Remote Work Divide. So Igor, welcome to the Work From Home Show. Thank you for having me. What a what a time to be hosting a work from home podcast. <laughs> it's uh it's certainly unprecedented in terms of the 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 rise of of this remote work experiment many of us are fortunate enough to be in right now. And uh, yeah. and of course it was rising before then too as you know. <laughs> so yeah, well, very we, well well-timed show. Glad to be on it. Yeah, we actually started the show after the the pandemic started after the lockdown. Like literally days after uh we we launched around March 20th, and around March 15th is when the the lockdown started sweeping the country. So it's been it's been great hosting the show. The feedback has been awesome. Our listenership has grown. So we're we're really thankful for that, Igor. So let's first start with the basics. This virus it came in. It didn't just come to the United States. This is a global pandemic. The entire world. We're talking what four billion plus people. They've been affected by this, and because they've been affected by this, their work has been affected by this. So tell us, how has this virus reshaped working from home moving forward? I think that even leading up to 2020, the fastest growing commute type in the U.S. was essentially no commute. There was this, we've already been seeing this big rise in the prevalence of working from home. So you look over the last 15 years, the number of Americans working from home is up 76%, you know, far greater than, than any other commute type you might look at, you know, essentially the commute from your bed to your, your desk or your kitchen table or your home office or whatever it may be. So it was already something that a lot of researchers were talking about, people that are interested in in housing markets and labor markets have been talking about the rise of this really remote workforce that was in large part enabled by a lot of the technological innovations that have happened over the last 20 years. So people were able to say to either start new businesses without an office or, or to ask their employers, hey, I would like to move back home or to this new city where I can afford a home. And uh, I would like to continue to do my job remotely. Can I do that? And disproportionately, employers were saying yes. With that said, there were a lot of people that, you know, frankly, thought working from home was pretty controversial. You know, it was like, are all these people going to be productive in a remote setting? Aren't there so many distractions at home? Thinking in particular of sort of remote workers that are attached to, to bigger companies or, uh, or, or to, you know, that aside from just the entrepreneurs that start their businesses in, in their own homes. And so it was something that was pretty um, controversial. And a lot of people, a lot of business leaders said, no way, we can't run our companies remotely. And then when COVID-19 and the pandemic hit, essentially every business that could be taken online into a virtual setting and and that could have their their employees work from home were forced to try the experiment <laughs> and uh, right now what we're seeing is essentially a huge wave of companies evaluating hey we've been without the office for in our san francisco for 11 weeks um how productive have we been? What 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 do we miss? What has actually been easier? And it's really igniting this conversation around remote work and the potential to lead remote workforces 
uh, which I think will really accelerate this rise of working from home going forward. Now, one of the things that I've been wondering about that I think you'll be able to help with here is whenever this turns around and you have people who can work from home, who continue to work from home, how do you think it's going to impact the jobs of people who, like I'm thinking primarily of jobs like teachers who, you know, they're doing crisis schooling now online, but that's not really going to stick, I don't think, for the most part when it comes to like K through 12. But do you think there's going to be a shift away from jobs that do require you to go to the office? I mean, I'm not talking about like manufacturing or steel workers or anything like that, but in the jobs that currently can't be done from home or in the facility, like if you're kind of without a job right now, do you think there's going to be a shift away from those jobs in the future or do you think people are going to go back to them? It's an interesting point. I think that right now something is being exposed that was kind of around all along, which is that the jobs that enable remote work. So anything that is kind of a, you know, what, what sometimes economists will call part of the knowledge economy, you know, the people that for a living create designs or ideas or write or, or create software products, you know, things that are sort of intangible but valuable. Those are the high paying occupations right now. So if you look across the economy, there's a really strong correlation between who can work from home and what their income is. So you look at people making over six-figure salaries, over half of them say that they could work from home. And you look at people making less than the median minimal income, for them, it's, it's less than a fifth you know, of, of people uh, uh, making lower salaries are, are able to take that work home. And I think that is sort of this divide that's really salient right now because the people that are asked to sit on the sidelines, they can't take their work home with them those were the ones that were really you know less well off going into 2020 and and this pandemic is just exacerbating the challenges that they were facing i think that may to your question have an effect on the type of occupations that people go into you know in this sort of thinking through the class of 2020 that's graduating in in may from college are they more likely to have their first job be potentially remote? I think absolutely. And that'll probably have, have some, some lasting effects there, there as well. And I think it'll also change, frankly, where people move to, you know, because a lot of moving decisions are based on where can I get the best job and where's the best job is kind of where are the best employers located. If you don't care where your employer is located because you can work remotely, your calculus around where you want to move to also changes a lot. So I think that's the other factor that, um, you know, I don't think it will be the world turned upside down starting in 2021. But I do think we'll see this slow shift towards, you know, more remote occupations, more remote work. But also, you know, I think people will be a little more evenly distributed throughout the country uh, if they don't have to rely on the hot job centers uh, as much as they did in the 2010s. Yeah, and Igor, I want to talk, just going through your background, just to backtrack a little bit, one thing I like about you and your background, a lot of the commentary that we're getting today on the economy, even on medicine and science, these are individuals who got their PhDs or their formal train of thought pre-internet. So uh, as we know, one major reason work from home has taken off is because of internet technology, the growth in IT. You got your PhD recently. It, it appears you're a, a millennial. And on top of that, you have, <laughs> right. a, you have a background uh, undergraduate and a PhD from Stanford, which is really the heart of technology. I mean, it's the heart of Silicon Valley, some of the mm -hmm. greatest entrepreneurs went to Stanford, probably actually, I think most of them dropped out. I don't know anyone who actually <laughs> finished their degree there, who went on to found great companies. But you were kind of in the thick, and maybe you still are, of really the hotspot for entrepreneurship, for technology, for business, for innovation. And I think that's, I just think that's pretty awesome, because a lot of what we get, the politicians, the economists, they don't understand the role of online and digital and technology in the economy moving forward. So I think it's it's just a, mm -hmm. a great, great treat to have you on the show because there aren't too many millennial economists who uh, have the, the background that you have and who can kind of talk about and understand the role that technology plays 
in the future of our global economy. And the only politician, he's not a politician, but the only political person who I saw talking about it was Andrew Yang, uh, mm-hmm. because he has an entrepreneurial background. But even President Trump, who who's a business guy, he doesn't really get the, you know, the, the whole technology and work from home movement. I think his son-in-law does, and I, I think that's why his son-in-law is uh, advising him on those things. But it's just something that hasn't caught on and more people, more politicians, more economists need to be paying attention to this 21st century way of doing business. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, to some degree, there's like a big paradox almost that's been emerging in terms of the way technological innovations are produced, because probably the most transformative effect of all this technology has been the ability to connect people across large distances, the ability to, to get products from a long way away, the ability to connect with coworkers a long distance away. And a lot of technology really enabled a lot of this really distant communication to happen very seamlessly. And that was almost its main purpose in many cases. With that said, the people that largely built all those technologies, they they needed amazingly close to the other people that they were building this technology with. You know, so when people talk about Silicon Valley and all the companies that are here, you know, it is somewhat ironic, really, that, you know, you have companies that are building these tools that are helping people to connect with family on the other side of the world, but they don't think that they could even move to central California and be as productive. You know, it's like the people that actually make the technologies have been getting closer and closer together, you know, maybe, and some people maybe say it's somewhat reached a boiling point with all of us crammed into pretty expensive office space and in, uh, in open office environments in, in San Francisco. You know, I think that that dogma is even being challenged right now. You know, do we need to be in the same room as the engineers to build this feature? Do we need to have everyone in front of a whiteboard literally, or can we do this this virtually? I think that that's a, a, a facet of, of really the tech sector that's somewhat on trial right now, because the tech sector, while enabling all this great remote work for many industries, itself has really continued to cluster in, you know, not just Silicon Valley, but in places like Denver, Raleigh, Austin, you know, very few people are, have been taking their tech jobs to their remote beaches and mountains where they want to be their best selves. They've still been in these really kind of dense innovation clusters. So that's a really interesting thing that's just happening right now where companies that thought that they could never build all these things without density of talent are starting to question that. I think it is also important to think about the pandemic in the context of all the technological innovation that's happened that has really enabled enabled us to take so much of the economy online. You know, if this was COVID-1990 and we were all sheltering in place, it would be a very different world and a very different economic downturn if we weren't able to do so many of the things that we're doing right now online. So um, I think there is a, a, a lot to the intersection of technology and just the nature of work now that that is really unfolding before our eyes. Now you work for Apartment List, which is potentially terrifying. Uh, Naresh and I, we do some real estate coaching for people buying single family homes. And I've noticed, we noticed that a lot of the cities that are getting hit hardest are the ones where people are clustered together like New York City. And I think that's one of the reasons California is so terrified and shutting down is because they know that they have, you know, cities where people are clustered together. Do y'all at Apartment List have, are y'all worried about the future of apartment complexes as people want to get out and, you know, have a little more space so that they're socially distant from their next door neighbor and, you know, their high rise apartments? What's y'all's take on that right now? I think it's a question that's on a lot of, not just within the company, but in, in anyone who on housing is thinking about the question of are people going to be hesitant, not not just to move to multifamily buildings, but really just to to dense urban areas. You know, really, really the last 10 years, we've seen a huge amount of money pouring into downtown areas, to walkable urban neighborhoods all across the country. And I think there's a question mark. Are we going to see people starting to you know, demand a little more space rather than wanting to be sort of close to the action, so to speak. You know, I I think if I were a a betting man, which I guess with my time I am, I I think the demand for for multifamily will still be there, but I think it'll also adapt and change 
as a lot of other sectors are starting to adapt and change. You know, I would have thought that in our data, we would have seen people really change the type of housing that they're looking for through our platform right now. But so far, we actually haven't seen that effect almost to a comical level where, you know, you would think that the number of people telling us that they want an apartment with a gym or a pool would have fallen, but it stayed pretty flat. The areas that people seem to be searching for are, at least as of now, very similar to what they were before the pandemic. So I think that preferences will adapt, but they will take some time. And I think that both the multifamily sector and and, and the, the single family market, I think we'll just find ways to adapt to what this new decade will, will really look like, whether that means rethinking community level amenities and how people gather and, and build relationships in the multifamily space, or whether that's, you know, how are we going to design a bunch of new homes with the anticipation that they're also going to be used as offices uh, as remote work takes off. I think our housing will just change in ways to adapt to, to the preferences. And I think that's likely the housing that's going to be successful. So basically what you just said is that people took a two and a half month vacation and then they're going to just go back to their regular way of, of thinking. But from a work from home perspective as a business owner, are you seeing that this work from home movement is is going to become permanent and that commercial real estate and those big office buildings and retail shopping centers? I think the number that I saw was that 30 percent of them aren't going to open back up. Is that what your data is telling you? I think that there's what's in the data and there's also just also us as a business navigating what we do with our workforce, right? And I, I think a lot of people fall into different camps. <laughs> you know, when, when you look at as a business, you look at your employees, some of them are saying, I am avoiding a 90 minute commute right now. I have never been more productive. I would even prefer to work from home even after the pandemic ends. Others are saying, okay, I don't have a very comfortable workspace here. I'm a lot more productive at the office. Others are saying, I miss the office. I really want to be back there. And, and we're trying to kind of, even aside from just the hard data of what's happening in the market, there's also all this soft data that business leaders are trying to take in on eliciting the preferences really of their, their employees that many of them have now some experience of working from home, but it's a strange experience, right? Like uh, I'm working from home and I'm also, you know, we're running a, uh, a preschool and, uh, <laughs> and, and a daycare from home because we have our kids home and it's, uh, we're trying to juggle many things at once. So everyone is trying to learn from this experiment, but it's a very strange because ex- nothing is set up the way you would if you had a year to prepare for a long stretch of working from home. So that data, I think, is important to business leaders to say, you know, will my company continue to be as productive if we don't re-up our, our commercial lease, if we don't need all that space in an expensive market? And I think, will certain companies decide need less office space? Almost absolutely. You know, so I think, I think there's um, uh, certainly a lot of concern in, in the commercial real estate sector, but also somewhat of a feeling of opportunity, I think, among companies that are reevaluating how they they interact with their workforce. Yeah, I would say, you know, looking at if your workers right now can be productive from home in this environment, they're going to be massively more productive whenever the kids can go back to school and they're not um, <laughs> doing right. all of this stuff. I mean, because right, right now, a lot of people are just in, you know, even if you're in the information economy, you're sorting this all out. You know, this is, I think that this has launched the work from home movement forward by, you know, 10 or 20 years, maybe even more. But whenever you make a jump that big, it's going to take a bit of adjusting. Now, whenever you talked before about people still looking for places to live with the, you know, with the gym, with the pool, have you seen much in terms of people who can't work from home and are, you know, you mentioned they're the most susceptible, obviously, to not being able to afford rent. Have you seen people looking for lower price rent points at this time? I think that right now what we're seeing is that those being hit financially are probably not as likely to be in the market, you know, especially some of the, you know, you look geographically, some of the real tourism dependent economies have been hit very hard. And, and to some degree, we're seeing, you know, less flow of moves from those markets. I think though, 
broadly speaking, I think that a lot of people are going to come out of this period with a new set of circumstances. And oftentimes that precipitates a move. So I think we will start seeing a lot more downgrade moves so to speak, potentially people moving in with more family, moving back in with family, uh, getting more roommates, even though they actually want more space to themselves. So I, I think that that is going to start happening soon. And, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll comprise a large portion of the moves this summer as people try to say, OK, on one hand, my work has changed. The small businesses that I was in this whole community for have gone out of business. And I think people are going to reevaluate where they're living. But, you know, the, the ones that I think are are coming out of the pandemic right now and looking for new housing are likely the ones that are really delaying moves and, and are trying to go through with moves they potentially already had planned but but couldn't execute on earlier in the spring. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I just kind of thought of this. I wonder if this will lead to more places doing kind of what I call the like the college leases, where instead of, you know, leasing an apartment to four people, they lease it by rooms and then the common area so that if another situation like this comes, you don't have to get rid of or don't try to evict, you know, everybody. You can just say, hey, you one room, you're out. The other three of y'all or two of y'all can stay. It'll be interesting to see if that becomes more of a thing. There was already, I think, a lot of investment in kind of co-living, broadly defined, which some people called the future of housing, which is something like what you're describing and other people called, you know, dorm rooms. But I think there's a lot of potential there still, given that even though rents are starting to inch down, rents are still very high relative to incomes, especially for people at early on in their careers in a lot of um, leading job centers in the country. So uh, I think that's an interesting point in terms of another potential for that to, to get some extra traction coming into what looks like a significant recession. A big, huge chunk of the U.S. workforce, really the, the global workforce, they either experienced a layoff where they had a reduction in hours, they had a decrease mm-hmm. in pay, and this is largely because these jobs, they were not work-from-home friendly. So what is kind of your outlook on these industries, these jobs, these functions, these positions that are not work from home friendly, where they have to go into a physical location. What's the future of those? I think what we're seeing now, two things. One is, you're absolutely right, that as we would expect, right, the jobs that can't be taken home are are the ones that are much more significantly affected through this massive wave of layoffs. So, you know, even in our survey data, when we were asking thousands of Americans over the last couple of months about whether or not they were able to afford their housing, you know, we found that those that, that were in occupations that could not be done from home, they were five times as likely to be laid off and twice as likely to miss their, their housing payment in April or May. I think that a few things will happen. I think that this will have a significant effect on growing inequality because, like I mentioned, the jobs that cannot be taken home tend to be more higher poverty jobs. Um, in fact, there are no high poverty jobs that can be done remotely and there are no remote jobs that are high poverty jobs in the u.s right now you know there's a real big divide between those that can and can't work from home and i think that's already growing and i think that what will probably confound this in the recovery that is always a question through times of economic turmoil is going to be really how technology adapts to potentially even replace some of these jobs that necessitate you know face-to-face interaction. You know, if um, we live in a world where there's a, you know, a big second wave of infections in the latter half of 2020 and people get really nervous, you know, about going out to a restaurant, you know, you might see more restaurants where you kind of order from an iPad, you know, and that takes a huge hit to the restaurant industry and those people employed by it. So I think those jobs will be under pressure to really shift and adapt as we see that they already are, as we're seeing, you know, uh, restaurants reopen with, new guidelines for social distancing with a different outlook on capacity. I think that's a small example of a broader trend we're going to see in the next really few years. Here, and I'm sure this is the case where you are in in California, and I'm sure Austin as well, but it's been so efficient to basically go on my phone and put in what I want to eat, let's say from, from a restaurant, and then just go to the restaurant, like with my wife, and dine in and the food's already prepared. We don't, we don't have to wait around for, you know, to place orders and, 
you know, wait for a server. It's like they already have it in their system and we show up and we, we go sit down. And oh, we don't sit down later, here. We don't sit down in Austin up. right now. <laughs> you can't go into a restaurant here. <laughs> oh, you can't go into a restaurant in no. Austin? No, they're opening up in the near future, but no, you can't go in yet. Oh, here in Tampa, I guess I'm the only one. You're in California and Austin. Here in Florida, the restaurants are pretty much all open. They say 25. They actually upped it to, as of this recording, it should be at 75% capacity. But basically, the free market has uh, dictated. I mean, people aren't taking it seriously. They're, they're not taking the 25% capacity, the 50% capacity. It's like, okay, we got people waiting for food. They can come right in. But the point I'm making is it's easy to just go on your phone because you weren't able to do this before. You have to go in and place your order with the waiter or waitress. And if the restaurant's busy, then you have to wait and you might get bad service. But now you can just do it on your phone or do it online and then show up to the restaurant according to your reservation time. And boom, two minutes later, the food's ready for you. So mm-hmm. I, I just found out to be really, really convenient. And as you said, Igor, that kind of takes away from the job situation, you know, like it's not really necessary to have that waiter anymore. Yeah. And and I think that jobs and industries always adapt to where, you know, we, we've had not us personally, but we as a society right, have had the conversation of, you know, will this innovation kill all the jobs conversation for so many generations now that at this point we We have some confidence that people will adapt and the job market as a whole will recover. But it's always also worth noting that the job market as a whole doesn't mean that any particular individual family will recover because um, the transition costs are always substantial at the personal level, even if the market always tends to adapt and find new ways of employing the workforce in at the macro level. So you're the former economist over at Airbnb, and I assume you still know some people in that industry. What are your thoughts on how this is going to impact Airbnb and short-term rentals after everything is lifted? I mean, you know, you've got people in the higher income levels who are right now, they can't go on vacation, like they can't do their summer vacation, but they still have that money, they're stocking it up, and you know, vacations are going to happen sooner or later. If you're, for people who are in that situation, like, are you looking at lower prices for Airbnb as more people are just trying to get somebody to come in or higher prices as they try to make up for, you know, lost uh, revenue? And what are your thoughts on the, the future of that right now? I think in the long run, people will really still want to travel, <laughs> you know, when as soon as they're able to safely. I think the the recovery might be less about price points, but more about the type of travel. You know, one thing I noticed even just as a, a consumer, I would, would log on and all of the advertised destinations for me uh, to plan future travel was all domestic. You know, so I think what's going to happen is there's a certain pen of demand, I think, for travel right now. A lot of people have, that had vacations or some kind of trip planned have, have canceled it. Everyone is, is itching to get out of their home. Yeah, nobody's going to, to Disneyland right now. Nobody's going to Disneyland right now. But that doesn't mean that once people feel safe, they'll hop on an international flight again. I think they'll, you'll see a lot of activity coming back to domestic uh domestic destinations that aren't very dense or crowded that people can drive to. That might be places in Oregon, if you're on the West Coast, it might be uh, St. Augustine or uh, Charleston on the on the East Coast, like, I, like, national parks. You know, I think we'll see first kind of domestic travel come back. I think we will start to see business travel boom back. And, and, you know, as we were talking about workforces shifting remotely, you know, one of the big I'll tie this back into kind of short-term rentals as well, but but as as a slight detour, you know, I think one of the things that has actually made working from home or being re- a remote worker easier during the pandemic is that there's not a lot of hiring going on. There's not a lot of promotions that are happening. So there isn't a lot of team building that needs to happen. You know, you're, you're kind of with your crew and you're just cranking on what you need to do. I think that if companies start going remote, there's going to be added pressure and incentive to get the workforce together for big events and for team building and for training and for camaraderie and culture more often than we do now because we see each other at the office all the time. So I think that business travel will then come back and that will be, uh, again, a boost to mostly domestic travel, I think, at first, as people start to get their remote workforces together 
once in a little while to make sure that the team building is still happening and that those personal relationships and working relationships are still being made, not to mention all the conferences that have been postponed. You know, that's a, a huge industry that that has a lot of pent up demand and supply in it. So I, I think that that level of, of travel will probably fuel a lot of the domestic short term rental market for some time as international travel likely takes longer to recover. But I do think there's an interesting connection really between work and also the the need to travel more for business, which will be a boost to the hospitality sector more broadly. We have Igor Popov. He's the chief economist at Apartment List, former economist at Airbnb. Igor, what is the quarantine economy and who would you say were the winners during the quarantine economy? And as this quarantine economy continues, even after the lockdowns are lifted and people get back into day-to-day activity, who are going to be the winners moving forward? I think that the quarantine economy has really been this moment where the only two kinds of people have been able to work while everyone else has been really on the sidelines. People that are deemed essential, you know, by the, the local ordinances, and people that can take their work home with them. I think there are a few winners in an absolute sense. The technology sector will also build a bunch of new tools to enable these people. We've seen that with all the investment happening in video conferencing, in the real estate sector. We've seen it with widespread investment in virtual tour technology. So um, I think the this will be in retrospect, a turning point for for the rise in in remote work and working from home. Now, one term that you brought up, which I think we need to touch on, and that's an essential business. I actually, uh, I'm, I'm a free market economist. And now that the government has labeled businesses as essential or non-essential, I feel like that's going to have an adverse impact on businesses that are considered non-essential. Because now they have that label, oh, you're non-essential. Like, you're not important in my eyes anymore. Like, you know, you don't need our business. Like, you don't need to be around. The world can function just fine without you, which I had problems with labeling businesses as essential versus non-essential. What are your thoughts on that labeling and the impact that it's going to have on the economy as a whole? Yeah, I think that I almost try to be careful, right, with putting essential in air quotes, right? Because anytime the category of non-essential includes something like school teachers, you know, there's, there's the words essential and inessential mean something very different in this pandemic context than they do in, in conversational English, right? Because I think everyone would agree that for the, the long-term health of our, of our economy and democracy, school teachers are incredibly essential, right? I think that everything is the time horizon. And, and I think that the real effort was to think, you know, if, if things are going to be shut down for a few months, what can wait and what can't? And I think that was, to some degree, a, a necessary exercise. I think, though, where a lot of strange things started to happen were actually where things weren't categorized at the business level, but at an industry level. You know, And within an industry, there might be things that we think can wait and things that can't get wait, but they all get painted with a broad brush and conversely so. So I think that I almost wonder if this will be something that, that, that lasts longer than intended in terms of the way that people think about these business distinctions. But I think that had people thought that this would be, you know, let's say a year long lockdown, the idea of what is essential would have also been a quite, quite a different decision as well. So there's certainly some awkwardness in the classification, but I think as people were responding quickly, they, they needed to do the best they could to keep some parts open. But as sometimes happens, especially in the U.S., it was a, often a, a state-by-state or locality-by-locality decision, which created an, a, an interesting patchwork. Great. Well, Igor Popov, thanks for joining us on the Work From Home show. He's a chief economist at Apartment List, former economist at Airbnb. Website is apartmentlist.com, apartmentlist.com. Igor, any final mm-hmm. thoughts that you have our listeners or a website or an email address you want to pitch? Oh, sure. I I think um, if you find this stuff as interesting as I do, definitely feel free to follow our research at uh, apartmentlist.com backslash rentonomics. That's where we put out a lot of our data and analyses um, on on how the rental market actually interacts with a lot of the, the trends that we've been talking about today. But really want to say thank you for having me on. That was great to chat. Awesome. And there's also Igor Dash popoff popov.com igor-popov.com 
And the paper that you guys put out, which I think are, we're going to include a link to this in our show notes. But if you were to Google economies growing remote work divide, the economies growing remote work divide, you'll see the, the paper that Igor and his colleagues over at Apartment List and Rentonomics put out really insightful and analytical on the future of our work from home movement. We've talked about really almost the entire paper on this episode today. But if you want to see charts and graphs and some other good tidbits, check out apartmentlist.com slash rentonomics. Igor, thanks so much for joining us on our show once again. Thank you so much. And for all our listeners, www.workfromhomeshow.com, workfromhomeshow.com to check out all of our previous episodes. Get on our mailing list there. We're giving away all sorts of free stuff. And until next time, keep on working from home. (laughs) 